Well, good morning, and welcome to Cliftondale Congregational Church. Uh, just want to take this time to just unburden ourselves and to let the, the whatever happened this week just kind of leave us for this hour and to slow ourselves down and allow ourselves to focus entirely on God and to hear what He has to say. Uh, and hopefully, we'll even have a word to handle whatever we may be going back to. But we want to start with prayer, so please join me in praying and inviting God into our presence. Father, as we come before you, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the joy we have to gather together. For where two or three are gathered, you are there as well, and we know your presence is among us. God, we do ask that your Holy Spirit come mightily upon us. We ask, God, that you will bring revival 
to our hearts, to our minds. God, that you'll give a word that will have some relevance to what we are facing in this week. Father, we do ask that as we talk about sanctification, that we talk about how to get closer to you and the need to get closer to you, that throughout this week and, and, the, and, and the year and, and really our lives, that we will do that, that we will seek to follow all the more dearly and nearly closer to you. God, we do ask that you be with each and every person in here. I know you have something to say to us, and we ask, Lord, that you attune our hearts so we can hear it and that our worship may be pleasing to you. And we ask all this in your son's name. Amen. And especially today in the new year, uh, we do this every week, but let's slow down and, you know, this is the way Jesus taught us, and let us just take some time to, to really mean these words and to think about them as we pray them. Do we really want our Father's will done on earth as it is in heaven? So let us, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, tis now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Good morning and welcome again to Cliftondale Congregational. You know, there's been a lot of loss for all of us over the last year. Myself, I lost a close friend in the last few weeks, and I know some others are celebrating anniversaries today of those they've lost. So I wanted to share um, something that I read, an article last week that brought encouragement to me. Pain and loss transform us. While they sometimes unravel us, they can also push us to a deeper life with God than we ever thought possible. They make us rest in God alone, not what we can do or achieve for him, and not what he can do or achieve for us. In pain and loss, we long for presence, his presence. We long to know that God is for us and with us and in us. Great families, financial wealth, and good health are all wonderful gifts we can thank God for but they are not his greatest blessings. They make us delight not in God, but in his gifts. God's greatest blessing always rests in God himself. And when we have that, we are truly blessed. And with that in mind, let's begin our worship time with hymn number 562, Be Thou My Vision, hymn 562.
continue by singing All To Us, and the words can be found in your bulletin. All To Us. So this week, I was driving from one meeting to another one at lunchtime, and I stopped at Wendy's for a quick bite. When I ordered my meal, I had a choice. I could have one burger patty, or two burger patties, or three burger patties, and I could make my drink a small, or a medium, or a large, and I could do the same with my fries. And all the fast food chains do this. When McDonald's first started it, they called it supersizing. But they were not the first ones ever to supersize a meal. Did you guys know that? Did you guys know that McDonald's was not the first one to supersize a meal? Did you know that in the Bible there was a meal that was supersized? No? All right. Well, 
I'm going to read a story to you guys from the Gospel of John, chapter 6, starting in verse 5. And it says, When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for all these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for already, he already had in mind what he was going to do. <coughs> Philip answered him, Eight months' wages would not buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Eight months' wages wouldn't be enough to feed these people. Kind of like Christmas dinner seems sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Philip answered him, oh, sorry. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and the men sat down, about 5,000 of them. 5,000. That's a lot of people. You ever, you ever made food for 5,000? I've made food for like a couple hundred, and that's a lot of food. 5,000? Wow. Lost my place again. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with, his, with the fish. When they had ha all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So remember, five loaves, two fish, 5,000 people. Everybody's eating as much as they want, and they're going to collect the leftovers. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over from those who had eaten. Twelve? So what do you think about that story? Remember, the Bible says that everyone ate and was satisfied. And when they were through, they gathered up 12 baskets of leftovers. That's, that's a supersized meal, huh? Yeah. So I'm sure that that one young boy with his small meal, going to hear Jesus, didn't think he was going to be able to make any difference. But he ended up being part of one of Jesus' best known miracles. Now, oftentimes, it seems like we're taught that bigger is better. But that's not always the case, is it? In fact, throughout the Bible, God uses people who seem insignificant to accomplish his great purpose. So remember that when you use what God is giving you, you can do wonderful things. All right? So let's pray. Dear Jesus, please help us to remember that when we willingly give what we have, no matter how small, you will use it to do great things. Amen. Father, as we come before you, we thank you that we can come to you even in the midst of all the noise and busyness of this world and even in the midst of all the prayers that you receive on any given moment. God, you hear ours clear as, as a bell. And God, that you are just as focused on our prayers as you are on any prayer around the world. What matters to us matters to you. So, Father, we come to you with requests. We pray for rain in Australia. We pray, God, that you watch over Puerto Rico and the people there who have already suffered so much. And we just ask, Lord, that you'll give them a reprieve and also send them help. And, God, there are things on our hearts that only you know, things that are burdens that only we carry, in fact, you know them more than we know them. As your word says, the Holy Spirit that lives within us prays with groanings that we don't even understand. You know us better than we know ourselves. You know what, what we need more than we know ourselves. We also ask, Lord, that you help us to be the answer to prayers. That maybe we're the type of person who has the solution for what somebody else is praying for. Maybe we have the ability to speak truth into something because we've experienced, because we've walked through it. And maybe we can use that experience to help somebody else. Help us, Lord, to be aware of those. And God, we praise you. We praise you for all the good that you do, for getting us up, for our health, for all the blessings of friendship and even down to the most mundane things. We are at your mercy, and you are merciful. 
And we thank you for all that you do. And we ask all this in your son's name. Amen. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Incline thine ear to us and grant us thy peace. Amen. Please join me in praying our corporate confession as printed in your bulletin. Holy Lord, we confess that there are parts of our lives that are ruled by sin because we have not yet crucified them with Christ. We repent of the times we gave into our sinful nature this week. We ask that your Holy Spirit make us more sensitive to the things we need to surrender. We count yourselves dead to sin, but alive in God, in Christ Jesus. Thank you for the assurance of forgiveness, peace, and new life. Amen. What shall I say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him and that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death has no longer mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once and for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to Christ in God. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and offer the parts of your body to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall not be your master, because you are not under law, but under grace. Let us pray. <clears throat> Father, as we come now to the reading of your word, God, as we talk about sanctification, God, as we talk about this lifelong process of you working in us, we ask, Lord, that nothing more, nothing less than what you'd have me to say, be what comes forth, that you become greater, I become less. And we ask all this in your son's name. Amen. So I have here the very first piece of what I call real art that I ever bought. It was art that wasn't a movie poster. <laughs> so I bought it in Arizona from a Navajo artist. It's, uh, just a, it's a Navajo pottery. And Somewhere along the way, it got lost. And I fretted about it for the longest time and was really sad for the longest time because I didn't find it. And any time I'd go back to Texas, I'd look all through the house, all through the shed in the back, anywhere where it might have got lost in the transition from Texas to here. Finally, my mom was able to find it and sent it back to me. And I was thinking about this today you know, this is, this is mud. That's all that this is. You know, you can see the color. It, it, it's mud. It's mud, if you've been to Arizona, it's, it's mud that you would pick up, or dirt you would pick up just from the ground and in a parking lot. But it's been turned into something else. Even if it had just been shaped without any of the decoration, it would still be beautiful. It would still be something more than mud. But the artist took it, not only shaped it expertly, but made this intricate design on it, and then marked it with their name. And 
you know, if, if you've ever done pottery, and I took a class in, in college, you know this is not easy to do. It looks easy in the hands of a master where the master just kind of, it just seems to, to go wherever the master wants it to go. But if you've ever tried it and not been practiced, then you know it's, it's a lot harder. It takes constant guiding the clay, shifting it, shaping it, cutting it, trimming it, a little here, a little there, until it's, it's, the, it, it's the shape that you want. But it started out as a lump of clay. It started out as, as dirt. And it's still clay. It's still mud. But it's been given a new life. In a way, this lump of clay has been justified. It's been selected out for a purpose. And it's, it bears little resemblance to the lump that it started from. Little from the mud from which the lump came from. It's literally a new creation. We don't see a piece of mud, we see a piece of pottery. In this sermon, we're continuing in our three-part series on the basic life cycle of a Christian. We started with justification. And you may notice there's a page for you to take notes. We're going to be covering a lot of scripture uh, today. And, and these are so important that I really want, if, you, if you're able to take notes, to, to take them. Because these are very, very important. This is, these are the three basic doctrines of our faith. Um, and very important. So last week we considered a concept called justification. And justification is just a big word for us coming to Jesus, declaring him as our Lord, and it's the process by which a Christian is born. Scripture tells us that, and Jesus tells us in, in his own words, that we are not given salvation or favor with God through our own merit. Our merit's going to fall short. That's literally what sin means. Sin is, in, in, the, in the Hebrew and in the Greek, is an archery term. It means to miss the mark. And our good deeds will always fall short. They'll never cancel out. There is no cosmic scale where our good deeds are on one side and our bad deeds are on the other. Uh, one, even the smallest of sins, tips that scale in, in the direction we don't want it to go. So what did God do? Well, God sent himself in, in the form of Jesus as a human to be the payment for our sins. To gain what we could not achieve. He who was without sin became sin. So that we could be righteous. Our debt of sin declared paid in the eyes of God. That's literally what is meant when Jesus' last words on the cross, it is finished. The word there is the word for it is paid. It is paid in full. It's a financial term. We cannot earn it. It's just something we receive. It's like a debt payment that someone pays on your behalf. It costs them, but you get the benefit. And it's a wonderful gift, but it is not free. It was, a, it was costly for Jesus, and it also costs us something. It doesn't cost us anything really morally, but it does cost us the, 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 the right to have control over our life, to be the Lord of our own destiny, to be the Lord of our lives. We put God on the throne. We enter into servanthood to the Lord Jesus. But it is in that servitude ironically, that we find true freedom. And as it says in Isaiah 64, 8, it says, we are the clay, you are the potter, we are all the work of your hands. So today we're going to be talking about sanctification, which is a big word for what happens between that time you believe and that time in which we are called home to God, which we'll talk about next week. But to continue with the potter, pottery metaphor, justification would be, again, taking the mud and the clay, and from the dirt. It's now been separated for a purpose. Sanctification would be the process by which that lump of clay becomes this. It takes a lot of time, it takes effort, and it takes the work of a master. It, this pottery didn't make itself. It was made by somebody who knew what they were doing. So that is sanctification. Clay is a valuable, valuable material that can be used for a lot of things. But it, it is when it is made into something like that pottery that we can see its full potential for beauty. It is in this form that it becomes something we treasure. Something that is worth tearing at least two houses upside down for to find. And just as clay can't sculpt and mold itself, 
We need Jesus to do that work in us. We are the clay. We are beautiful. You are something that God treasures. Treasures to the point that instead of waiting for us to pay back everything we owe him, which would have been just folly, there is absolutely no way we could have done that, he did it himself. That's how much he wants to be with you, to, to have you with him. There is nothing you can do to make him love you more. There is nothing you can do to make him love you less. He desires for you to spend your life in abundance with him and also eternity with him. So just reflect on that for a moment. Just the links that he went to. And we just got done with, with Christmas, you know, coming, coming as a little baby. And then eventually we'll start into the season of Lent, into Easter, dying a death of a criminal when he deserved nothing. He did not deserve that. So we believe that Jesus is who he says he is. Okay, we can check that off. And we profess faith in him and we exchange our life for his and we put him on the throne and we take ourselves off. That's check. So now what? What do, what do we do? Well, we enter into a lifelong relationship with Jesus. When we are justified by faith, that is going to change things. If we really mean the words, Jesus is Lord. We're not saying it to impress anybody. We're not saying it because it's the thing you do. We're not saying it as a rite of passage. We mean it. Then things are going to change. You're going to notice things a little bit more. You're going to notice your bad habits a little bit more. You're going to notice the mistakes in treating others that sting a little bit more. You're going to have a thirst and a hunger for God and, and want to know more about Him and be with Him. And you're going to become more compassionate. And the way you speak and joke is going to change. You're not going to gossip anymore. You're not going to do any of these things. And it's not because of moral effort. It's not because we just say, you know, I know what it means to be a good Christian and I just need to try harder. It, it's not that. We can't do that. We cannot in our own moral strength do that. It has to be something that God does. And it becomes a response. Sanctification is not about religious do's and don'ts. It's about being open to what God wants to do in us and being willing to let him shape us, being willing for him to move in and rearrange the furniture and remodel and, and whatever he wants to do. No holds bars because we desire holiness. We desire to, to reflect a humble and thankful awareness of what has been done for us and for the payment for our sins a desire to be pleasing to God, a desire to reveal him to others because that peace that we have, we're going to want to share it. We're not going to want anybody to miss it because so many people strive for so many things, strive for happiness, strive for peace, and so few get it. When, when, when you have that gift, it's, it's like having the cure to some disease and you can't wait to share it. But as I spoke of last week, there's a difference between knowing about Christ and being in Christ. So we just read Romans 6, and this is the classic explanation of the need for Christ to be Lord in our lives and to have, have reign in our lives. As Jesus said, you cannot put old wine into new wineskins. So when we become a Christian, we become something very new. And we begin having new things added into us. Paul in this passage is addressing a classic problem. If we are forgiven... If we are justified, why do we need to continue to worry about sin? Aren't they all paid for and we are good to go? We are justified, but we continue to sin. And the problem is, how do we deal with that sin? How does that make it, us feel? If we accept it, if we tolerate it, then that is an issue that then goes back to, did we really mean that Jesus is Lord? If it stings a bit and we're convicted of it and we continuously struggle against it, then that, that is sanctification. And we get stronger each and every day. We get better maybe even by just 1% every day as we follow after Christ. So he even presents right in the very first part, he presents this ludicrous argument that, you know, well, if God's grace is greater based on how much I sin, well, maybe I should sin so that makes God look greater. And it's kind of a logical question, if not a, a 
kind of a crazy one at the same time. But Paul's answer is resounding no, and it goes back to this whole justification thing. I was thinking about this. I was thinking of, um, you may know the movie, An Officer and a Gentleman. I was thinking of that, that phrase. I've actually never seen that movie. have no desire to see that movie. Um, I take that back. I've seen parts of it. But um, it, in the military, there's a code of conduct for officers. Officers are soldiers. They're the same as everybody else. Wear the same uniform, but they're separated out. And should they violate that code, they can be charged with behaviors unbecoming of an officer and a gentleman. They have a standing. They, they have a, 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 a way in which they should conduct themselves that's different than the rank and file of everybody else. This is very similar to what we're talking about today. As Christians, when we are justified, we are separated. Literally, the Bible calls us saints. I know in other traditions, saints are a totally different thing, but all of us, if we are in Christ, are saints because that's all that word means. It means you have been called apart, set apart, made something new. And it's in that moment that now we have, to have, a, we have a new standing with God. We're reconciled to God, and we're, that's going to make us act different. It should. We have to aspire to live by a different code because we have been separated out. We have to hold ourselves to a higher standard. But the problem is we're still at war with our fleshly standard. We talked about this last week where Paul said, you know, I, I, I want to do the right thing, but I still, there's a pull to do the wrong thing. And I, I don't understand this. And I just, I just feel wretched. And thankfully, that's what Jesus paid for. This, as far as, as this life is concerned, in the next life, we won't have that problem. But in this life, we will continuously feel that pull because of our own fleshly nature. Also because there is the enemy who is opposed to God, but I try not to give him more credit than he's due. A lot of it is, is ourselves and our own propensities towards sin. Uh, and we all do it. Nobody has to teach us how to lie. Nobody has to teach us to be selfish. No, it's it's inerrant, or inherent in us. But when we come to Christ, we submit ourselves to Christ, and we begin to say, you know, I'm not going to walk in that. So how do we do this? What are some of the things that we need to be on guard about? Well, if you will turn to the book of Galatians, um, a little bit to the right of, of Romans. I didn't write down the page number, but Galatians 5. It's, uh, it's going to be on 1815. We're going to be spending the rest of our time here in, uh, in the book of Galatians because this, this really gives a great uh, parentheses of what sanctification looks like, what first not to do, and what first is the goal, or what after that is the goal. So Galatians 5, we're going to start in verse 19, going through 21. Well, first off, and I just actually noticed this, 5.1, it is for freedom that Christ has set you free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. That, that's what this is all about. If we are in Christ, we cannot fall back into the old ways. We cannot fall back into where we were. Now, of course, we're going to stumble. We're going to fall. There's forgiveness. But we can't say we're a Christian and still act like the world. We have to be something different. So what are some of the things to avoid? Starting in verse 19 of chapter 5 of Galatians. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passion and desires. This is what it st is at stake. To be a Christian and still in the grip of these things, and all of us on this list can find something, probably several things, that 
that we struggle with. And to still be in the grip of these things, to be a slave to these things, is unbecoming of a Christian. Remember, it is for freedom that Christ set us free. Not to be religious, not to just to, to even be moral, but to be His, to be sanctified, to be holy. And all these things run contrary to that code of conduct. All those run contrary to God. None of these things are going to be in heaven. None of these things are going to be things that we will experience in eternity. All of these will pass away. So we have to continuously seek to crucify these things within us, taking them every day and, and seeking God. Again, there are things that all of us struggle with. There are things I struggle with. There are things you struggle with. None of us are perfect. None of us are finished product like this. We're at various stages. But God is faithful, and God will give us completeness if we let him. As I said again, Mark uh, 2.22, you don't have to turn there, but this is all the words of Jesus, and I already alluded to it. It says, no one pours new wine in, into new into old wine skins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wine skins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wine skins. God cannot put a new blessing and new life if we insist on holding on to who we were or what we had before we knew him. Our conversion is just that. It's meant to change. The word is, is metamorph metamorphosis, literally. To change, to become something completely different. And if we are serious about that, it will. Not by moral effort, but by surrender. Surrender to God. I have known folks all through my ministry that profess faith in them, but there is no change. I've known people in seminary that look just like the world. This is not the way it should be. Romans 8, the same verse that starts off with, there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus, says this in verse 5. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it. Those in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. But notice the juxtaposition here. Death versus life and freedom. Life and peace. We are going to be a master to something. We're either a master to ourselves, or we're a master to God. Or we're a, we're a, a servant to God. Paul continues, You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, if you've meant those words, Jesus is Lord, and you are seeking to give him free reign, then you are in Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will always, always give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. In other words, if we are seriously seeking God, not just trying to try harder, but, but coming to God daily in prayer, several times a day, praying and praying and praying, if we are seriously seeking after God, it is going to pay off. And when you look at these things and what the choice is, it really is a no-brainer. We do what we want, that leads to regret, that leads to all kinds of chains being on us. But if we choose to live life in the Spirit, we get life and peace. Even what we did in the past, even the things where we mess up, we don't have to dwell on those things because they're gone, as far as the East is from the West. That is something that is guaranteed. But again, we've got to be willing to give up those things. We can't have secret closets that Jesus is not allowed to go into. 
We can't, when something comes up against what we just read and we say, well, you know, that's just the way I am. You can't, we can't say that. That may be who you are now. But that's not who God wants you to be. He wants you to look like his son. And the more we look like his son, the better we're going to know him. And this is my biggest concern as a pastor. This is why I am, I am so passionate about discipleship, because this sanctification part is, is, is the whole deal. Jesus is not our fire insurance. Jesus is our Lord. And again, it, it's, it's not to judge anybody. It's not to, again, I'm a sinner too. But I want what, I want you to have what I have. The regrets and the things that may be burning us down, we don't have to live with it. The world doesn't have to live with it. There's another way. We don't even have to pay for it. We just have to accept it and be open. And again, the alternative, when I, when I read the alternative, I don't want anybody to miss the kingdom of God. As good as sin is, as much pleasure as it may bring, remember, eternity is the, is the main goal. And even in this life, like it, 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 whatever good it brings, it doesn't last that long. And it's not worth it. And, and I know sin is not something that is popular to talk about. But it would be spiritual malpractice for me as a pastor to not talk about it. And I'm not talking about it as somebody who has it all together. I'm talking about it as, as I like to say, as one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. That's my concern, because I want us all to make it. And there's no reason we shouldn't. Because again, it's not about being morally correct or anything like that. It's about being holy. It's about being righteous. And it's just a matter of submission. And it's the most ironic truth in the world that by submitting ourselves to God, becoming slaves to God, literally that's what Christian means, little Christ, that's when we're at our most free. That's when we have the freedom because we're not weighed down by the world. And yeah, the world's not going to understand that. And sometimes that means we have to take stands on things that the world says, eh, that doesn't matter. But if it puts somebody's souls in, soul in danger as a pastor, you better believe, because I love each and every person in this church. I'm going, I, I would rather make you mad at me than not tell you the truth. Because I tell it to myself first. And I hold myself to that standard. We can't encounter Jesus and his grace and go back to the old life. We got to be moving towards a new life. And it's a good life. It's a good life. It's the best life. And one day, as we'll talk about glorification, that's why it's called glorification. That's literally what happens when we die as a Christian. We're perfect. We're perfect. So one day that's coming, but for now we struggle. But we don't have to fall back. We will still sin. We will, we will still, despite our best efforts, fall short. But as it says in John 1.9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Don't have to pay any money. Don't have to say you know, half a dozen prayers. You just go to the Lord because that is the right he gave you through his son. And a little bit later in 1 John 2, 1 through 2, it says, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate, an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not only for ours, but the sin of the whole world. You, we will be tempted to sin. And I can guarantee you, the more you, you go to God, the more the devil's going to try to get you. But also, it's like working against gravity sometimes. But stay faithful. Stay strong. In those moments of temptation, the Bible says there is a way out. God will show you a way out. Pray in the midst. Like we pray each and every time. We pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Pray that. Pray that when you feel temptation. When you feel that temptation to to look at something you shouldn't. When you feel that temptation to get angry or say that thing that you know 
is going to hurt, and you'll never be able to take it back. Or any number of things. There's always a way out. So moving on, and we'll be finishing up soon. Galatians 5, 22 through 25, the other half, says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. There is no limit. You can love, you can have joy, you can have peace. There's no limit to that. And again, we crucify the sinful desires. We go, God, I'm still struggling with this. I'm still struggling with that. Help me. Help me, help me. You know, flee, we flee from it. We make the changes in our lives to, to, to not indulge. Maybe we get somebody else involved to say, you know, I need you to kind of hold me accountable to this. Ask me about it. We need to shed light on the dark places in our life. And when we do that, as 1 John says, we're walking in the light of God. And it will change everything. It will change our leisure time. It will change even the most mundane things. Everything will be sacred. Everything will be more enjoyable. We don't walk around with sad looks on our faces like we're going to a funeral. We're going to a, a wedding. That's what Revelation says. So we can be joyful. We can look at the sky and we can appreciate it. We can look at beauty and appreciate it. We don't have to have any of these things weighing us down. We can live life abundantly more than anybody else, even in their most free state, doing whatever they want. We will have much more freedom than them. And you will have peace. You'll have peace with the past. You'll have peace with the present. You'll have confidence in the future, knowing that if you slip, God's going to be there. It says he has, we have an advocate. So as we close... Take time to spend with God and seek to cultivate your relationship with Him. Take time to reflect on the ways He has transformed areas in your life and which areas you still need to surrender Him. Again, some of us here, I don't, there are two, two things I don't want to do. I don't want to first say it's all grace and no effort, but also I don't want us to just feel like what I like to call worm theology. It's somewhere in between. Be thankful for where you are. It's as John Newton said, uh, if you know anything about John Newton, John Newton's the guy who wrote Amazing Grace. And he was a slave trader. He went and he got the slaves from Africa and brought them over and eventually was converted and left that and recognized that as sin. And he said, you know, I'm not who I need to be but I'm not who I was. And as long as we can say that, we're on the right track. And every day, his, the Bible says, his mercies are new. So don't, again, it's, 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 it's not even about moralism. It's just be open and, and look at the scripture and look at Jesus and say, how close am I? And how do I get closer? What do I need to remove in my life to get closer? What do I need to strengthen? What are my strengths? What are those callings and gifts that I, I can actually use for more? But what, wherever you're at in that, you will find, if you go through this process, if you open yourselves up, if you make Jesus Lord of your life every second of every day, you'll have more peace and more life than anybody trying to do it on their own. It'll take daily discipline, but it is worth it. You're in the hands of a master potter. And he already thinks you're beautiful. He already thinks that you are worthy of dying for. But he's going to make you even better. I want to close with this verse. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 through 24. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Let's pray. Father, as we come before you, we thank you that you don't give up on us. And God, that we don't have to worry about doing things in our own power. God, we submit to you. We open our hands, we, we lift them up to you, and we say, we surrender. We surrender whatever it is in our lives 
that is not congruent with what you want. We also praise you for the things that you have given and we, we seek to use our gifts to be who you have called us to be. But God, help us. None of us are where we need to be. But hopefully all of us can say, thank God we're not who we were. Father, may 2020 be a year where we get to know you more dearly and more nearly and walk with you more closely. Starting today. Starting now. We ask this in your son's name. Amen. Stand as we sing together hymn number 329, There is Power in the Blood, hymn 329. Please pray with me. Father, as we go from this place, we just ask, Lord, that you help us to be your hands and feet. And we just ask also that you bless our fellowship time during the coffee hour. We ask all this in your son's name. Amen.